Well guys, I know we just got done sorting that torrid business with James and all of his personal baggage out, but I think it's time we return to that empty vacation resort. I've been getting the feeling that we're not quite done with the events of our first trip, and I don't know about you guys, but if there's one thing I want after watching a man lose his daughter to a deranged demon-worshipping cult, it's closure. So pile in everyone, it's about time we put an end to this insanity once and for all. For those of you who've made this trip with me before, expect something a little different from what you remember, and for those stumbling across this town for the first time, well, welcome to Silent Hill. Back in the heyday of the PS2, Konami could be called a lot of things, but unwilling to capitalize on a successful franchise is definitely not one of them. After SH2 managed to capture an even bigger audience than the game that preceded it, we were certain a follow-up was on its way, but what we didn't know is that it would have a much smaller team than before, which could spell bad news, but in this situation was perfectly reassuring. That's because the main components of Team Silent present for parts 1 and 2 were on board for this sequel, and if there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this retrospective, it's that these guys know how to make a detail-rich and engaging video game. Oh, and before we get too deep into this, I'm sure this is going to turn into another lengthy trip, so check out the description where I'll be leaving a sort of table of contents with timestamps for all the juicy details. And with that out of the way, just like before, E3 and the gaming press at the time made sure we were assaulted on all sides with Silent Hill 3 Media, and just like before, this worked perfectly in getting me excited as hell. It was very clear from the outset that Team Silent had the goal of one-upping their previous effort, an idea that might have seemed impossible at the time, but, well, we had no idea what we were in for. During the pre-release hype for SH3, I found myself reliving Silent Hill 2's production, and what I mean by that is, while I enjoyed the trailers and images being released, I was a little dismayed to find out I didn't recognize any of the characters being shown off. To be completely honest with you, I started to wonder if Silent Hill had turned into an anthology of unrelated stories, but before we get into how wrong I was, let's talk basics. This game, much like its predecessor, started out with a piece of media as its inspiration. Silent Hill 2 used the Russian novel Crime and Punishment as a jumping off point, which played out as a gritty look into guilt and how humans deal with the terrible things they've done. Well, this time around it seems like Jacob's Ladder was the siren call for Team Silent, only this one wouldn't be as much of a one-to-one -one adaptation. Instead, Jacob's Ladder plays more of an auxiliary role, inspiring themes of questioning reality and whether or not all of this is as it seems. But these ideas tend to remain on the periphery. The main story is more of a traditional tale of, uh, well, let's just take it from the top. You come here and enjoy spilling their blood. Silent Hill 3 starts off with a nightmare of a terribly creepy amusement park, and at its apex, our main character wakes up in her local mall. After a quick call to her dad to explain her lateness, she's confronted by a PI named Douglas. Apparently, he knows her name and has been paid by a person who wants to find and talk to her. In these first scenes, we get a real feel for these people. Heather clearly has a lot of love for her dad and is very obviously not in the business of taking any shit. My name is Douglas Carter. I'm a detective. A detective? Really? Well, nice talking to you. So to avoid any more time spent with a guy who looks like your local flasher, Heather ducks into the girl's bathroom and makes a hasty escape out the window. In trying to double back and lose the trench coat wearing investigator, she stumbles across something unexpected, I guess? Well, maybe that's underselling the situation a bit. Now armed with what looks like a Beretta, Heather finds herself navigating an empty mall, which now that I think about it, empty might not be the right word. It seems like the place has been flooded with creatures of the Cthulhu-esque monstrosity variety. Heather eventually finds another human, but in true Silent Hill fashion, she's more about delivering cryptic and puzzling statements, and less about properly explaining what the hell is going on around here. After what you could charitably call a conversation, Heather doubles over in pain and is introduced to a very familiar concept. That's right, our girl is having her first brush with what Harry liked to call the other world. Which may not seem like a big deal, I mean this is Silent Hill after all, we probably should have seen this coming, but 
it's not the other world that's causing the confusion, it's Heather, or more accurately, Heather's location. This is all taking place in Portland. Sure, we're used to Silent Hill's spiritual power being able to bring manifestations straight from your inner psyche and implement them into the real world, but how the hell is this happening outside of that cursed town? Team Silent seemed to be toying with the established mechanics of this world, and from this point on, I was absolutely hooked. I had never played a game that had me so interested right off the bat before. I mean, sure, I was initially here because of the series' pedigree, but the events happening in this very early part of the game perfectly set up a mystery I was more than happy to unravel, but I think mystery is the key word here. This game's events are better uncovered than they are explained, so as usual, I'd recommend skipping to the time on screen to avoid any spoilers to this incredible story. Okay? Alright, let's dig in a little deeper. After the mall incident and what must be the longest trip home anyone has ever taken, Heather comes home to find her father has been murdered by Claudia. And at this point, we start to ask ourselves, why the hell should we care? We've never even heard the man's voice, so why is his death being treated like such a meaningful moment? Well, take a quick look at that face. Yep, that's right, we are looking at Harry Mason, the main character of the first game, meaning Heather must be the little girl from the Good Plus ending, which of course opens a whole new world of questions as Heather and Douglas return to Silent Hill to get revenge on the woman who murdered her father. Once there, Heather starts to remember things about her past and finally begins to discover that she is essentially Alessa, and just like Alessa, she's pregnant with the physical body of the demon god Silent Hill's cult warships, which explains her being able to manifest the other world outside of Silent Hill and not a lot else. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this was a twist that absolutely took me for a ride. Maybe it was my young age or the fact that I rarely try to figure out a story while I'm experiencing it, but finding out that I was playing as a person that was essentially the antagonist of the last game, or at the very least a conduit for the antagonist of the last game, really blew my mind. This made these characters automatically seem more familiar to me, and I think this is where I deviate from most SH fans. In my opinion, this is an amazing story, one that stands as the absolute best example of storytelling in the series bar none. You mock God? Traitor. You now don't get me wrong, the absolute terror of part one and the mystery and psychological aspects of part two were incredibly deep and interesting, but Silent Hill 3's story does something totally different and in my opinion is much more effective for it. See, SH3's story isn't the real draw here, or should I say the events of the story aren't. What really pulls me in and makes me feel like I'm a part of this world are the characters. Now, I know this is a very subjective view, but there's something about the intersection of well-written personalities and the best voice acting I have ever heard that makes these people feel real to me. Take Heather, for instance. Sure, she's scared out of her mind and has no idea what's going on around her, but she's also mad as hell. If I knew that, I wouldn't be so confused, would I? She can't understand the events taking place around her, and that really pisses her off. She doesn't just politely accept the cryptic language everyone uses when they talk to her. She yells at them to make more sense. If you ask me, this makes for the perfect stand-in for her audience. I mean, how many times did you get mad at James or Harry for just going with the weird shit that comes out of other characters' mouths? How many times did you yell at your screen begging for someone to elaborate on something? I know I can't be the only one doing that. But aside from that, she's just incredibly relatable to me. I've always had a soft spot for female characters in video games, but Heather was the first character I ever controlled that made me feel this kind of connection. I know it sounds weird, but I saw where she was coming from and felt like I understood her plight. Now, obviously, this has a lot to do with the incredible talent that went into writing, voicing, and creating her, but I think there's a lot of me in there. So when I describe Silent Hill 3 as having the absolute best story in the series, I do it understanding that a lot of that is very personal to me alone, and it might be hard if not impossible to explain these things inside of my head to you guys properly. And listen, I know, I review video games. Describing my own objective experience is supposed to be my job here, but sometimes I think things go a little too deep to accurately pass through the filter of coherent thought, if that makes any sense. To me, Heather might as well be real, and the people around her all feel the same. They're all me. Vincent is the more negative aspects of my personality, my greed and envy. Douglas is the part of me looking to do good in order to make up for my bad deeds. Claudia is my mindless and selfless devotion to the things and people I believe in, and my willingness to dirty my hands for a result I may not personally benefit from. And Heather? 
Now she's my passion, my teenage angst I still hold on to, and my protective attitude towards my friends and family. Okay, so I know this is getting a little deeper and more personal than I normally get, and I am 100% aware that I've described almost none of the plot so far, but sometimes I gotta write what's inside, and if that means a less informative description, well, that's gonna happen every once in a while. Like I said, I can't really verbalize all the things that make me love this story, its world, and its characters so much, but I hope there was something in these meandering words that gave you even a brief glimpse of my feelings regarding this incredible work. So I guess to sum things up, if you're looking for a meaningful world populated with characters that feel so real you could swear you've met them before, I'd say Silent Hill 3 will be your Citizen Kane. This is a deeply personal story for me, and I know this hasn't exactly been the most informative critique I've ever penned, but in this one instance, I'm more interested in expressing what's inside. Sure, I started this channel with the intent of convincing my friends to play all these great games, but mostly I wanted to come to grips with what all this means to me, wrapping my head around not only what I enjoy, but why I enjoy it. But on a much less subjective note, this is an amazingly well-written story that does a commendable job at both tying into Silent Hill 1 and wrapping up any possible loose ends the series may have had. Which does make sense, as this was supposed to be the end of the Silent Hill series, and while that didn't exactly pan out thanks to Konami wanting to milk it for every red cent it could squeeze out, you can really feel the finality of things after beating 3. It's clear this was supposed to put the nasty events of Silent Hill to sleep, and if you're even remotely interested in finding out where all these twists and turns end up, trust me, you're gonna wanna experience this story. So no matter what you do, whether it's emulation, real hardware, Let's Plays on YouTube, as long as it's not the HD collection, you definitely wanna put yourself in a position where you can experience this story. I promise you, it will be worth your time. Silent Hill is a series that was always dedicated to emulating and improving on the survival horror experiences that made the genre great. Sure, they could have changed up the gameplay, made it fit more in line with the types of games that were more popular at the time, but Team Silent had a vision, one that they were clearly dedicated to. So why do I mention all this up front? Well, Silent Hill 3 is exactly like Silent Hill 2 in that they are both perfect progressions of the games that came before them. The same survival horror gameplay that you got used to in Part 2 is all present and accounted for, in addition to a few incremental upgrades that serve to give you more options in combat, but before we get into combat, let's talk exploration. Silent Hills 1 and 2 were pretty similar in the sense that they were separated into two distinct but overlapping sections. One where our character would be exploring the actual town of Silent Hill, and another where they would be confined to a more strict interior area. When you had the freedom to explore the town, the game toyed with a very open world kind of feel, but of course nothing like what we know as open world today. Something more akin to Stalker, where most of the environment is cut off to the player, but a bit of persistence and some luck would have them stumbling upon a cache of healing items or ammo. Now, if you'll remember, in my review of SH2, I said I was a little disappointed by the fact that it spent a little less time in the town and more time navigating the narrow hallways of an interior area. Well, I'm sad to say Part 3 continues this trend with even less time spent in the actual town than Part 2. Of course, in its defense, you do spend a good chunk of the game outside of the eponymous town itself, but still, I would have loved to have seen more familiar sights. Okay, so a little bit less frantically running around Silent Hill looking for spare health drinks. It's not ideal, but there are certainly worse things, so if we're spending even more time indoors, do these parts do enough to make up the difference? Well, in my opinion, Silent Hill 3's exploration gameplay blows both of its predecessors out of the water. I think a lot of it has to do with me finding the layouts of these areas to be just the perfect cross-section between organically explorable and realistic-feeling architecture. Don't get me wrong now, SH2 had amazing locations to explore, but oftentimes they would seem sort of contrived. Honestly, I'm not really sure how to explain it. Maybe too video gamey would be the right way to say it. And of course, there was my one lingering complaint with two not having an abrupt shift to the other world, making exploration seem like it lasts twice as long. Well, the good news is Silent Hill 3 has you bringing the other world forward at set points in an area, and just like one, this helps immensely with keeping exploration from feeling stale. Almost like clockwork, as soon as I started to feel fatigued with an area, something would trigger Heather to manifest her fears and inner darkness into the environment. This means an altered layout and more of a challenge combat-wise, which was amazing for keeping me engaged. As far as combat goes, you guys know the deal by now. Hold a trigger button to ready, press X to attack, hold it for more powerful attacks, and there's a straight function, once again, that I 
never really used. This time around, I was happy to see a few more melee implements to mess around with, and overall the combat feels much more tight and challenging. In part 2, you really only had to position yourself correctly and make sure your swing landed first, and you were all but guaranteed a victory thanks to long stun states. In 3, enemies seem to recover from being hit much quicker, and it also feels like they have much less of a windup before one of their attacks land, meaning I was way more likely to take damage in a fight than I ever was in part 2. Even when I had a good situation on my side, I would get caught with the odd close range haymaker. This little tweak made sure combat was something I was scared of, something that served as an equalizer for the overall gameplay, and a reassurance that I would not be flush with healing items for very long. Which leads to my next point. This game is far more conservative with giving out ammo and supplies. At the end of Silent Hills 1 and 2, I was full to the brim with health drinks, first aid, and ammo. But in 3, I had to scrimp by with next to nothing for long periods of time. Sure, I had plenty of handgun ammo, but that was because I was actually running from most enemies a tactic I only engaged in by habit in the older games instead of necessity. So yes, the game is more difficult in a traditional sense, but it's more rewarding in a survival horror sense. But they did add a couple of options that would help you mitigate this. Beef jerky can be found that will have most monsters worried about eating it instead of you, but this was always hit or miss for me. Sometimes I would put it down, it would perform its intended purpose, and sometimes monsters would just bypass it and make a beeline straight for me. This led to me not using it that much, but it's nice to have on you in a pinch. And in keeping with the theme of Team Silent making only small, incremental changes to their formula, Silent Hill 3 features items that can modify combat to a degree. From a bulletproof vest that decreases damage but reduces run speed, to a silencer that makes it easier to fight without alerting everyone in the room but decreases attack power. These little additions feel great and add a layer of complexity that wasn't present before. Of course, if you don't like messing with tradition, you can always elect not to pick these up or just not using them. For me, this was a genius way to augment your average survival horror combat without messing around too much with the pillars that make everything what it is. And speaking of which, it can't have survival horror without puzzles, and I have to say the challenge here seems a little more mechanical than previous games, which I know doesn't make any sense, so let me explain. Silent Hill has always been known for puzzles like figuring out which keys on a piano to play or where to put certain items based on some type of riddle or poem or math problem. And while 3 definitely has a few examples of this, it seems like most of the puzzles are the find obstruction then apply item to obstruction sort of variety. I was actually surprised by this since the years have caused me to remember things slightly differently. Looking back, I always remembered the challenging puzzles in this game, but coming back to it, I was taken back when I found a more Resident Evil style approach to puzzles. Now, this isn't exactly a downside, I mean both types are pretty damn satisfying, and it's not like the quality of these head scratchers has been diminished, they're just different. Maybe in a way that only someone playing these games back to back would ever really notice. But there is one thing that got on my nerves a bit, and it's going to be very, very hard to verbalize, so here it goes. It seems like the environments were developed in such a way that they are just a bit off-center in regards to how Heather moves. Okay, so I know that doesn't make much sense, but this scene behind the mall has always been my benchmark for this. See here how I can't keep Heather in a straight line? Kind of like the direction of this alley is laying in between forward and a diagonal in regards to Heather's possible degrees of movement. So why the hell would I spend so much time trying to explain such a dumb concept? Well, first off, if you're anything like me, you're going to notice it anytime you need to run long straight lines. And, well, the rest of the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal. There's literally nothing to complain about here except for one very small thing that I can barely figure out. It's essentially the exact same experience as the game that came before it, but improved in such a way that it's totally noticeable and very subtle at the exact same time. If you ask me, this is the perfect sequel. It not only draws from what the previous games accomplished, but sets out to do even more, all without changing the general feel of playing a Silent Hill game. Without a doubt, this is the apex of the series, and even though it's not a perfect game, it is a perfect Silent Hill game. Sure, people that aren't keen on survival horror or psychological horror still might not like it, but as far as the genre goes, you just don't get better than this. To me, SH3 is one of the greatest horror games ever made. It's not only interesting and deep in that way only Silent Hill games know how to accomplish, but it's also a perfectly polished experience with next to no glitches, spelling errors, poorly programmed assets, or any of the other issues we've grown used to from modern AAA releases. So, if you're looking to spend a good portion of your time equal parts scared, excited, and suffering from extreme amounts of existential dread, and let's face it, you should be, 
pick up a copy of Silent Hill 3. It truly is a marvel of creative and technical know-how and should serve as the game all modern attempts at survival horror must be compared against. Well, I've been pretty clear that this game's story and gameplay are the absolute best in the series, and I don't think I'm going to be blown any minds here when I say its presentation is also the best in its class. But even outside of a Silent Hill context, I'll be damned if this isn't one of the best looking games on the PS2. And I think most of this comes down to Team Silent's near mastery over the hardware they were working with, but a huge amount of the credit has to go to a solid eye for art and design. Sure, it's nice having what was a powerful gaming machine at their disposal, but the characters and environments would look flat and lifeless if it weren't for the team's incredible art direction and affinity for realistic lighting. Now, I know it can be hard to look at old 480i footage and hear someone calling it good looking, but check out how well it holds up against Onimusha 3, a graphically impressive game in its own right that dropped a full year after SH3. Now, I know this isn't exactly apples to apples, but Capcom scanned Jean Reno's face into the game. We can assume they're going for a more realistic look. But as you can see, Silent Hill 3 achieves it to a much more believable degree, let's say. Well, okay, comparing old PS2 games is fun as hell, but let's get back on track. By comparing some more old PS2 games. Taking a look here, you can see just how much ground was covered in the short time between the release of SH2 and 3. Faces seem to have more points of articulation and animate much more fluidly, and you can see so many more little details of things like hair and clothing. And since we're making good with the comparisons, I have to mention how happy I am to see the option to disable the static overlay being available right from the get-go. I ended up playing through both versions of the game without the static filter on, and I think just like in Part 2, it is a much better looking game without it. Right along with the static option, there's something much more interesting to play around with. The display option lets you toggle something essential, and one of the only things I've ever seen that made me question Team Silence art design. For some reason, I will never know. By default, Silent Hill 3 uses a kind of bilinear looking filter that gets applied to all of the game's graphics. Now, I'm sure there are some of you watching right now who don't like seeing sharp pixels in their video games, and while beauty is ultimately in the eye of the beholder, well, I mean, there's just no way of getting around it. You're wrong, and honestly, I suggest you get help. But in all seriousness, I can't see any scenario where you would want to do this to your game willingly. And as a guy who first experienced the game on a CRT, I can confirm it looked even worse on its intended display tech, so no blaming this one on upscaling. Why anyone at Konami thought this was a good idea, I will honestly never know, but on the plus side, they did end up giving us an option to disable it, so no harm, no foul, I guess? And going back to previous problems, this game is skewed off-center vertically, just like Part 2 was. Luckily, Part 3's screen position option doesn't trigger any weird artifacts at the bottom of the screen like SH2 did, so that issue, while still a puzzle for me as far as why it's there, kind of ended up solving itself, so that's good. But hey, there were bound to be a few flies in the ointment, right? If you ask me, these guys deserve eternal credit for pushing the PS2 to these limits, but how does the game look in context to what we expect from a Silent Hill game? Well, enemy designs are definitely up to the series standard, only with this time less human-looking proportions compared to those found in 2. Enemies all seem to fall into the Lovecraftian, formless horror type of look, and you really start to see the Jacob's Ladder influence when characters like Valtiel show up. There's also some nods to the first game with the incorporation of wheelchairs in parts of the environment. And since we're on the subject, man, this game has nailed realistic looking locations. Exploring the mall and subway station is incredibly surreal. These places look very convincing and show off Team Silent's well-known obsession with detail. For some reason, this area right here though, just outside of Heather's apartment, always struck a chord with me. I'm not sure if it's the lighting or design, but this place always felt real, kind of like it's somewhere I've been to before. But these locations are only half the story, and fans of the series will be happy to know that Silent Hill 3 does the other world justice. Just like its story, this is the ultimate culmination of what Silent Hill has accomplished over the years. These locations look even more uninviting and downright terrifying than they ever have. The rust is rustier, and the designs are even more dreamlike. I really like that the team made the other world look much more similar to how it did in part 1. I mean, sure, part 2 looked awesome with its ghost town decades after it's been abandoned and possibly hit by a natural disaster kind of look, but 3 hammers home a very similar design language to the first game, which I really, really appreciate. 
Getting just a bit off the beaten path, one thing that struck me after all these years of playing Silent Hill 3 is that the game doesn't use any pre-rendered CG cutscenes, which is a really crazy idea when you consider the fact that pre-rendered cutscenes essentially sold the last game. Now, this isn't a complaint for me because I really think it helps immersion when you don't have to be teleported to a CGI world every time someone needs to talk to you, but it was a really odd concept when it struck me because I never really noticed it, which is kind of cool. Once again, a huge emphasis on realistic lighting is present here, only this time with more of a focus on colored lighting in the environment. While the flashlight still uses a per-vertex solution leaving triangular boundaries visible, there's a bit of a blur applied to the effect which makes it much harder to notice. The same perspective correct shadows can be found on a lot of assets in the environment, and to this day, these still blow me away. One of my all-time favorite areas is the subway train near the start of the game. This one spot uses such an amazing blend of real-time and pre-baked lighting, great texture work, and realistic design to make this one area seem legitimately real to me. But hey, we're spending all this time talking about how good Silent Hill looks in the context of a PS2 game, but there is another option. A PC version of SH3 was rolled out only a few months after the original, and in a move that surprised the hell out of me and everyone I knew, Konami actually made up for their shoddy job porting SH2. Included is a configuration tool letting you set resolutions up to 1280 by 1024 and the game even lets you set rendering resolution, effectively allowing for a super sampled image. Once again, this is a port that I snagged on launch, and the experience compared to SH2's nasty PC version is night and day. I had no issues getting this up and running on my old Dell Optiplex back in the day, and everything from graphics to sound just seemed to work with no fuss. And I do have good news for you, modern operating systems do produce a similar result. I'm running this game essentially stock, with the exception of a widescreen patch allowing me to get a full 1080p out of this bad boy, and I gotta say, it looks out of this world. Seeing these incredible looking PS2 assets in even more positive light is a life-changing event, and if you don't agree that PS2 graphics upscaled to 1080p isn't life-changing, well, I think you may have stumbled across the wrong YouTube channel. For real though, there's so much detail here, and the dark black levels really help draw you in. Sure, I still have a soft spot for the PS2 original, but damn, it's hard not to jump ship and fully recommend this version. Unlike Part 2's PC port, there are far less inaccuracies to be found, and I gotta assume that's because there was no Xbox version to pull from. Whoever ported this game just had to bring over the full PS2 base experience, and it's a better game for it. Now, of course, there are a few flaws that become noticeable with the increased fidelity, but they're pretty small. For example, in some scenes, you can see a squared off boundary for Heather's flashlight lens flare, and if you're really scrutinizing the environment, you might notice a few low-res textures, which honestly is totally understandable. I mean, we are pushing this game much further than it was intended to go. Now, a back-to-back -back comparison isn't exactly fair in this scenario, but just for shits and giggles, let's see what we get. Obviously, the PC version takes the win here with its incredible look, accurate porting, widescreen capabilities, X input support, and, well, more accessible nature if you're keen on sailing the high seas, if you get my drift. In my opinion, I still have to side with the PS2 original based more on my initial experience on the platform and my flat-out love for the console's impressively unique video output, but even I have to admit the PC version is probably the best option to go for if you're trying to play Silent Hill 3 right now. Honestly though, it doesn't matter which version you go with. Either way, you'll be looking at one of the most graphically impressive titles of its day, and hey, disagree if you want, but to me, Silent Hill 3 looks much better than most Xbox 360 launch games. Now, most of this is thanks to a near maniacal level of attention to detail and a strong focus on art design, and while I can admit a bit of a bias on my part, I just don't think any other console of its day could have produced such incredible results. So I'm happy to say whether it's PS2, PC, or even emulation, this is a game you absolutely have to see with your own eyes, because if your dead body's gonna get drug away by a tall, otherworldly creature, it better be a high fidelity, tall, otherworldly creature. Well, by now you guys have probably noticed, I don't spend as much time on Akira Yamaoka's incredible music in these videos, and trust me, it's not from a lack of interest. These soundtracks are some of the finest music I've ever heard, but despite my background in recording music and fronting a band, I still just lack the words to express how amazing this stuff is. Well, luckily, I have a friend who does not suffer from this problem. Evan over at the YouTube channel Game Music Minutia knows two things above all else, Silent Hill and how to describe music, so 
in the interest of finally having someone on here who knows what the hell they're talking about, take it away, Evan. Hi everyone, this is Evan, also known as Game Music Minutia. As Jared explained, I love talking about game music, and as my early years of work on YouTube prove, Silent Hill is one of my favorite sets of scores to praise. So let's just get right to it. Through the first four entries in the series, composer and sound designer Akira Yamaoka managed to elevate the already beautiful and haunting visuals within the Team Silent games, making the scores and sounds an integral component of what we know as Silent Hill. Starting with the first entry, Yamaoka pulled inspiration from unlikely places, like Twin Peaks composer Angelo Bandalamenti, to create tracks that feature a melding of industrial, experimental tones with freeform and, oftentimes, avant-garde jazz. What's more, the impeccable sound design, from the sound of Harry's footsteps on metal grates to the incessantly terrifying radio feedback, brings Silent Hill to life, while also teaching the player how to differentiate between danger and safety. Pretty cool. Yamaoka carried that same quality to Silent Hill 2, however, bringing a refined focus on characterization. If Silent Hill's score was designed to inject added soul into the sleepy town, then Silent Hill 2's was crafted to distinguish the differences and similarities between the characters trapped there. Tracks like Promise, Heaven's Night, and Theme of Laura help us step into the emotional states of James, Maria, and Laura, even if we didn't realize it on a conscious level. And then came Silent Hill 3, which, in my personal opinion, served as a showcase for Yamaoka's best work in the series. Heather's struggle to understand her troubled identity and not conform to the town's will was brilliantly represented in Yamaoka's scores. Every song had a dual nature, reminiscent of Heather's confrontation with the pagan zealot, Claudia. Breeze in Monochrome Night and Dance with Nightwind, for example, feature the iconic experimental and industrial ambient sounds we've come to associate with Silent Hill, especially in the first century, but fused with delicate piano melodies and steady beats, which could be representative of Heather and her sense of modern normalcy. In other words, it's an auditory play on the old world mixing with the new world. In addition, Silent Hill 3's score features several songs with lyrics, like the killer I Want Love, which brings some lounge-style music to the overall package. And pro tip, get the album and listen to the studio mix of I Want Love because it's life-changing. There's so much more I could say about the soundtrack, but for the sake of time and not hijacking Jared's video, I'll leave the praise there for now. Thanks for listening. It means a great deal, and everyone watching should be happy to know that they're supporting a great guy who works extremely hard to bring us content on so many amazing games. So thanks again, Jared. Back to you. If this really is the work of God, then I'd say she has lousy taste. Well, by now, I hope my feelings on the matter are very, very clear. In my opinion, 3 is not only leaps and bounds above the other amazing entries in this series, but above most other PS2 games as far as satisfying gameplay, incredibly immersive stories, and razor-sharp graphics are concerned. This is truly the result of Team Silent's collective talent reaching some kind of theoretical maximum goodness. It's a culmination of all their techniques and know-how built up over the years, and it's fitting that Silent Hill 3 have that honor, as it was intended to be the last game in the franchise, according to certain members of the team. I mean, it makes sense they would go out with a bang, and even though it sucks to have something you've enjoyed for three entries and two console generations come to an end, it's nice being present for a climactic ending to an incredibly interesting saga. But if you ask me, that's what makes it truly impactful. An ending. Sure, Silent Hill's world's seemingly infinitely interesting, but knowing it could last forever is not appealing to me. I like things concluding in a satisfactory way, and without spoiling anything, SH3 is exactly that. It's a very fitting end to the long and sometimes confusing tale of a foggy vacation town and the cult that lives within it. Now, I know we're only three videos in, and I have already given away my feelings on the rest of the series, but I'll put it bluntly. If you're here waiting for me to cover a game in the series that tops three in production value, art direction, playability, or good storytelling, well, that's a long wait for a train don't come. Silent Hill 3 is, for me, the concept of skilled game creation made real. It represents my expectations for sequels to beloved franchises and is the reason I'm mostly disappointed with modern video game creation. Sure, we have more tech and advertising available to us than ever before, but we seem to have lost sight of what makes people play deep, meaningful, story-driven video games. We've somehow lost the character that was forged in the furnace of console limitations and very narrow genre borderlines. You know, when I think about it, maybe that's why Silent Hill 3 means so much to me. Maybe it represents the last of a dying breed, a group of misfits all dedicated to producing real art and given the financial freedom to do so by what should have been a soulless AAA company. 
I doubt very much that I will ever see a game like 3 again in my lifetime, and honestly, I'm okay with that. This will always be a story and experience that will stick with me, and it's in that that I have to admit one thing. You guys never stood a chance at getting a fair, unbiased review of this game. But if you're not currently furiously typing me an effigy in the comments section for something I've said here, I hope I've either made you want to give 3 a shot, or at the very least, made a reasonable case for my side of the argument. And if I didn't, well, the good news is we'll be shitting on the Silent Hill HD collection next, so maybe stick around for that one. And to those few brave souls that made it this far, thank you very, very much for watching the Silent Hill Retrospective. Hey guys, welcome to this, uh... This is an end, end card. This was an end card. Welcome to the end card, guys. <laughs> if you like your Silent Hill analysis mixed in with your fondness of music, I have Evan's YouTube channel, Game Music Minutia, listed right here. And if you're looking for more from me, I'll have some cool stuff on screen also. If you like independent videos like this one, maybe think about checking my Patreon out. And to the few of you that actually made it this far into the video, you're adorable and I love you. Now that's our little secret. Don't go around telling everyone. <laughs>